Life is a fragile thing. It changes and adapts so specifically to survive in the environment it's placed in. This ability to adapt is called evolution, and it's the reason that life has endured for the past few billion years. But evolution takes a long time, so when environments change too quickly for the inhabitants to keep up, the result is a drop in population, or at the worst, extinction. And some of these changes can be so big that they affect the entire globe, leading to some of the most catastrophic events in our planet's history. Mass extinctions. Five times during complex life half a billion year reign, the forces of nature have conspired against it, leading to the five mass extinctions. In each of these great dyings, anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of all life on Earth was completely wiped out forever. They are some of the most significant events in the history of life. And yet, I'm willing to bet that most of you only really know about one, the KT extinction event which wiped out the dinosaurs, which, funnily enough, is the least devastating of all the mass extinctions. Despite the importance of these events, the average person isn't really aware that many of them took place. So I decided to start this five-part video series looking into the five mass extinctions and how they rocked the globe. So, from the chilling tale of the end Ordovician extinction to the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs, these are the stories of the Great Dyings. Today we will be looking at the first of these five extinctions, the Ordovician Silurian Mass Extinction Event, otherwise known as the End Ordovician Extinction or the Late Ordovician Extinction Event. But before we explore the causes and effects of this chilling tragedy, we must first take a look at the world that it fell upon. The Ordovician period was the second geological period of the Paleozoic era and of the Phanerozoic eon. It lasted from approximately 485 million years ago to 444 million years, and was followed by the Silurian period. At this time during the Earth's history, life on Earth was still mostly confined to the ocean, although we have some evidence that some plants may have begun crawling out of the water by this point. However, these land-invading plants may not have boded well for the stability of the oceans, as we will see soon. A huge array of trilobites and conodonts, a group of eel-like vertebrates characterized by the tooth-like apparatus they use for feeding, made up much of the Ordovician marine life. Other animals such as brachiopods, snails, and clams also roam the seafloor. By the late Ordovician, the first jawless fish began to evolve. Most notably, basal cephalopods continued to adapt and by the middle to late Ordovician would evolve into monsters such as the 9-meter, 30-foot-long apex predator Camarocerus. Like everything else in the world at the time, the continents look alien compared to how they are today. Antarctica, Australia, Africa, South America, and parts of Europe were joined together in the southern hemisphere as the massive supercontinent of Guandamana. Other paleocontinents such as Siberia, Baltica, and Laurentia took up the remaining portion of the southern hemisphere. In between them and Gondwana was a body of water known as the Paleotethys Ocean. Meanwhile, the entire northern hemisphere was taken up by a massive sea known as the Panthalastic Ocean, where most of the marine life lived at the time. The climate was very warm, ranging from between 43 to 49 degrees Celsius, 110 to 120 Fahrenheit, although it would cool drastically towards the end of the period, which, as we will see, was one of the biggest causes of the end Ordovician extinction. Due to these higher temperatures, the atmosphere was very moist as well. Life was good and stable for the inhabitants of these early Paleozoic seas. That was until around 445 million years ago, during the Hironadian Age, at the end of the Ordovician. Like many extinction events, we can't exactly pinpoint a single reason for the Ordovician Silurian mass extinction like the asteroid that killed the non-avian dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. Instead, the extinction seems to have been caused by many uncertain factors that ultimately came together to form this terrible event. The extinction took place over about 1.4 million years during the Hironadian Age of the Ordovician and the Rudian Age of the Silurian, beginning around 445 million years ago and ending a little under 444 million years ago. It likely happened over two major pulses or intervals. Some scientists suggest the possibility of a more minor phase that took place before the two major pulses, possibly caused by falling carbon dioxide levels resulting from the erosion of silicate rock. This may have triggered a global cooling, which took place before the major glaciations. 
This phase may have affected members of the trilobite, brachiopod, and graptolite families. The first pulse of the extinction was the late Ordovician glaciation of Gondwana. We don't exactly know what caused this, but the theory suggests that an increase in continental weathering could have been responsible. Land invading plants may have also played a role in the cooling by drawing too much carbon dioxide from the air. Regardless of the cause, the Ordovician Earth cooled to a shockingly low negative 8.5 degrees Celsius, 16.7 Fahrenheit, which resulted in the glaciation of the African and South American portions of Gondwana. As if the freezing temperatures were not enough, the expansion of Gondwana ice sheets also resulted in the sea levels falling by 50 to 160 meters, 164 to 525 feet. This, in turn, led to a change in ocean currents as well. The combination of these frigid conditions and the plummeting sea levels led to mass habitat loss for many species. Organisms that thrived on epicontinental seas, bodies of water that lie on continents or over continental shelves, were especially hit hard by the dropping water levels as their habitats became drained. This interval is often referred to as the Late Ordovician Mass Extinction Interval 1, or L-O-M-E-I-1. This Ordovician glaciation lasted for a long time, but despite these harsh conditions, some life would adapt and diversify to form the short-lived Hernadia fauna. Life was just beginning to bounce back once disaster struck again in the form of the second interval. The next pulse or interval of the Ordovician Silurian extinction is known as the Late Ordovician Mass Extinction Interval 2, or LOMEI 2. It took place during the very end of the Hernadian Age of the Ordovician and continued into the Rudanian Age of the Silurian period. Similar to the preceding glaciations, we don't know for certainty what caused it. The warming of the Ordovician climate led to the depletion of the Gondon and continental ice sheets and subsequently a rise in sea level. This return of a warmer climate condition was, for some reason, followed by dire consequences. A sudden expansion in marine anoxia, or depletion of oxygen, and euxenia, raised levels of hydrogen sulfide, struck the already wary earth. These aquatic anoxic conditions spread globally, suffocating many of the few remaining species that survived the LOMEI-1. After a little while, conditions would return to the norm required to sustain life, but not before the global anoxic conditions could take a heavy toll. The Ordovician Silurian mass extinction event ended approximately 443.8 million years ago during the Rudanian age of the Silurian. Many endemic species, such as brachiopods endemic to Laurentia, were hit exceptionally hard by the extinction. In fact, endemic species made up much of the life loss in this great die-out. Many species of trilobites, bivalves, corals, and brachiopods were either hit hard or completely vanished altogether. Around 60% of all marine genera and 25% of all marine families went extinct. Overall, though, a shockingly high figure of 80% of all marine species were wiped out forever. It may have only been the first, but it was the second most devastating mass extinction in the history of our planet. Despite the major effects of the extinction on marine biodiversity, the ecosystems of the ensuing Silurian period did not really appear to be that much different from the biospheres preceding the extinction. This is likely because most of the species lost during the end Ordovician extinction were endemic, which means they were confined to a certain region. The endemic species which survived, however, take the Laurentia endemic brachiopods mentioned earlier, became more widespread during the Silurian, due to the extinction which forced them to find new habitats. Life would begin to bounce back from this devastation throughout the early Silurian, but it would take several million years to truly recover from this tragedy. So, there you have it. That was the chilling tale of the Ordovician Silurian mass extinction event, the first but second most deadly extinction to ever rock the globe. Today we will be looking at the extremely controversial late Devonian mass extinction, which took place approximately 375 million years ago, about 16 million years before the end of the Devonian period. This tragic event struck Earth at a very interesting time during Earth's history from an evolutionary standpoint. 
So before we look at this terrible event, we must first understand the world it took place in. The Devonian period is the fourth period of the Paleozoic era and of the Phanerozoic Eon. It is also considered to be the first period of the late Paleozoic subsystem. It lasted for around 60 million years, from around 419 million years ago to 359 million years ago. It was preceded by the Silurian period and followed by the Carboniferous period. The Devonian period is often nicknamed the Age of Fish due to the incredibly diverse and bizarre fish and marine life that swam in its seas. During the Devonian period, the Ammonites, a group of cephalopods that slightly resemble the modern-day Nautilus, diversified and became one of the many rulers of these seas. The Ammonites were an incredibly well-adapted and resilient group of creatures who would go on to populate the oceans for the next 350 million years until they would be wiped out by the asteroid that ended the Cretaceous. The seafloors were populated by many familiar enduring species, such as the brachiopods, graptolites, and of course the icons of the Paleozoic, the trilobites. Tabulate and rugos corals made up coral reefs in more shallow waters. One of the more interesting groups of animals during this period were the placoderms. The placoderms were a group of jawed fish characterized by their armored plates. They first evolved during the Silurian period as small, irrelevant animals such as Shimenolepsis. However, in the strange seas of the Devonian, they would evolve to become the kings of the Age of Fish. You probably heard of the most ferocious of these sea monsters, the Dunkleosteus. Named Dunkel's Bone after the scientist who found it, this prehistoric beast has been estimated to be anywhere from 3.3 to 10 meters long, 11 to 33 feet. Recent studies, however, have put it on the lower end of the size spectrum. Regardless, though, the infamous terrifying fish was the apex predator of the late Devonian. However, it wasn't the Dunkleosteus's intimidating size and appearance that gave it its edge. It was the armored plates, specifically around its mouth. These signature placoderm features were turned into a deadly weapon. Massive thick plates surrounded the and jutted out from the fish's jaws. These pseudo-teeth would have been able to deliver a blow of 36,000 kilograms or 80,000 pounds per square inch of force. To put that into perspective, it could have bitten you in half like a marshmallow. 400 million years ago, the secret to the Dunkleosteus role of tyranny was the same trait that its ancestors had evolved to protect themselves from apex predators many millions of years before. These once weak, tiny vertebrates became the unrivaled rulers of the Devonian seas. The jawed fish had won. However, this was not the most monumentous achievement that life would make during this very peculiar period. During the late Devonian, the first tetrapods, four-legged land-living vertebrates, made the very first steps onto land. Creatures such as Tiktaalik were one of these many strange animals. Evolved from fish which developed limb-like fins, they were the true pioneers of their time. Funnily enough, it was likely the tyrannic rule of creatures like Dunkleosteus that drove these animals to find refuge on shores. Arthropods had first crawled out of the seas a few million years ago, but these were the first vertebrates to become at least partially terrestrial. However, unlike their amniotic descendants, these amphibians had extremely thin skin and eggshells, this meant they were still tied to the water to keep themselves hydrated and for reproduction. It would take another few million years before the first reptiles, equipped with amniotic eggshells, thick skin, and powerful hearts, would evolve from these curious fish and truly dominate the terrestrial world. During the Devonian period, the modern-day continents of Australia, Antarctica, South America, and Africa were still joined together into the all-too-familiar supercontinent of Gondwana in the Southern Hemisphere. Accompanying Gondwana in the Southern Hemisphere was a paleocontinent constructed of Baltica and Laurentia named Euramerica. Other land masses such as Siberia dotted the rest of the Southern Hemisphere and some of the Northern. In between Gondwana and Euramerica lay two seas known as the Prototethys Ocean and the Paleotethys Ocean, while the eerily familiar Panthalassic Ocean dominated the rest of the Earth. During the Devonian, around 85% of the Earth's surface was covered in water. Compared to the hot climate of the preceding Ordovician and Silurian periods, the Devonian temperatures were remarkably colder. During times of stability, the ocean temperatures could range from 27 to 30 degrees Celsius, or 80 to 85 Fahrenheit. 
while land temperatures were slightly cooler at around 17 degrees Celsius or 63 Fahrenheit. Despite the mild climate, the temperatures at the poles were only slightly colder than that at the equators, which meant there were no ice caps or glaciers, at least for the majority of the period. Like many mass extinctions, we don't really know what caused the late Devonian mass extinction events. In fact, it is probably the most debated and misunderstood of all the great dyings. Also, like most mass extinction events, it was likely caused by multiple factors coming together to form the tragedy. It began around 375 to 372 million years ago, at the end of the Frasnian Age, and proceeded through the Fomenian Age until the end of the Devonian, 359 million years ago. It took place over approximately 15 million years during the late Devonian. As I mentioned earlier, we don't exactly know what caused it, but there are a few theories. The first of these major theories suggests the possibility of an asteroid collision, similar to the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. However, this theory is often criticized in modern science for a few big reasons. If there was a major asteroid impact during the late Devonian, similar to the one that occurred at the end of the Mesozoic, then why haven't we found another crater to support this theory? Also, an asteroid impact would have affected both marine and terrestrial life almost equally, but marine life was hit way harder by the extinction than life on land. Overall, the possibility of an asteroid impact is incredibly unlikely, but it cannot be ruled out. The second of these major theories suggests that an extreme global cooling event took place eerily similar to the one that occurred during the Hernadian Age of the Ordovician. Also similar to the global cooling during the end Ordovician, we don't really have an idea as to what might have caused it. This unexpected rapid cooling of the Earth would have led to the formation of glacial ice sheets and as a result falling sea levels. Over sedimentation may also have resulted in global marine aquatic anoxia conditions like the ones during the LOMEI-2. These conditions would have frozen and suffocated many of the inhabitants of the late Devonian seas. Underwater volcanism may have also caused the ocean conditions to become even more toxic. However, terrestrial life would have been relatively unaffected due to their ability to take in oxygen from the atmosphere. The last theory we will discuss today is a more recent one. It suggests that a supernova, the death of a star, may have damaged the Earth's ozone layer. The damaged ozone layer would have been unable to protect much of the life in the Devonian from harmful UV radiation. We see some indicators of this being a possibility in the fossil record. Rocks from the Devonian period contain many spores that have appeared to be scorched by UV radiation. Regardless of the cause, however, the late Devonian extinction seems to have taken place over multiple events that saw the extinction of different groups. A few more minor events may have taken place a few million years before the late Devonian extinction officially began. These events, known as the Lower Zilkov and the Tag Hanek events, saw the extinction of many Graptolites, Brachiopods, Ganeotites, and Corals. However, Things really began with the Kalwasser event around 372 million years ago. It led to the major extinction of many Ganeotites, conodonts, corals, and trilobites on the Frasnian Fomenian border. Following it towards the end of the Devonian was the more minor Hangenberg event, which saw the disappearance of several phacopid trilobites, Ganeotites, and cephalopods. Regardless of the cause or method, the late Devonian mass extinctions took a heavy toll on the marine ecosystems. Much of the unique ocean life was wiped out, including the king of the age of fish, the Dunkleosteus. Even this ferocious fish could not adapt to survive in this rapidly changing environment. The Dunkleosteus, once at the top of the Devonian food chain, was now completely wiped out. However, many tetrapods survived the extinction because the land was largely unaffected. This is a common theme we will see as we explore the later extinctions. It is the adaptable underdogs that survive these deadly events, the ones who can adapt fast enough to keep up with the changing environment, while the ones on top, like apex predators, are the ones that take the biggest blows, as the ecosystem holding them up crumbles. These beasts are so specialized to take advantage of their environment that when that environment changes, they can't keep up. The late Devonian mass extinction event led to the extinction of 50 to 55 percent of all genera, 20 percent of families, and 70 to 80 percent of all Devonian life. Despite this massive loss of life, the late Devonian extinction ranks only fourth 
in most deadly mass extinctions. Many deep water animals, such as sharks and bony fish, survived the extinction. This is likely because difficult conditions would have, have reached deep waters as easily as shallower water. Also, the overabundance of carnage above would have given these deep water fish plenty to eat during these trying times. The seas were completely thrown off balance by this extinction, and it would take another few million years for them to recover. But when it did, these resilient sharks would dominate the Carboniferous seas. Meanwhile, life on land was strangely unaffected. This may be due to the amphibians' ability to draw oxygen from the air, which would have protected them from the global marine anoxia. Throughout the Carboniferous, as oxygen levels rose, the land would become more and more habitable and more and more populated. As the land became more suitable for life, the first reptiles would evolve and conquer this last frontier. There you go. That was the story of the late Devonian mass extinction events, a devastating loss of life that began 15 million years before the Carboniferous and killed off 70 to 80 percent of all Devonian life, consisting of multiple events. The extinction that saw the death of many famous species, including the grotesque Dunkleosius. Complex life has endured on this earth for the last half a billion years. Throughout its epic journey, it has evolved into many different forms creating a world full of biodiversity. However, five times during Earth's history, there have been major drops in this biodiversity. These are the five mass extinction events, each of which have wiped out at least 70% of all life on Earth. Despite these many devastating events, however, life has always managed to pull through. But there was one time when it almost didn't. Around 252 million years ago, at the end of the Permian period, Life came the closest it has ever been to disappearing completely. In just a span of a million years, 300 million years of evolutionary progress was almost completely snuffed out. Out of the five mass extinction events, this is the only one which has truly been dubbed the Great Dying. The Permian period is the sixth and last period of the Paleozoic era. It lasted for around 47 million years, from 299 to 252 million years ago. It was preceded by the Carboniferous period and followed by the Triassic, the first period of the Mesozoic era. The Permian period is a very unique period in terms of animal life, geography, and climate. Marine life during the Permian has left behind a shockingly low yield of fossils compared to the other periods of geological history. However, this doesn't mean that the Permian seas were barren. It simply means that the conditions at the time didn't exactly agree with the fossilization process. This is known as preservation bias, where geological and climatic conditions prevent fossilization from taking place. I have an entire video about it on my channel that you can go check out if you want to learn more. Anyways. What we are able to tell is that the oceans of the Permian period were inhabited by many familiar creatures, such as graptolites, ganeotites, and other kinds of ammonites, and, of course, trilobites. Fish such as xenacanthus and acanthodes swam the seas as well. The apex predators at the time were sharks, like the ones that had been ruling the oceans since the late Devonian mass extinctions wiped out the placoderms. Probably the most well-known of these sharks is the helicoprion, famous for the bizarre whirl of teeth that it likely used for feeding on soft-bodied prey. Other than that, though, there aren't really any major things we know about the Permian Seas. So, let's look at life on land, where things really start to get interesting. By the Permian period, life had finally conquered the terrestrial world. With the vast expanse of land to explore, many interesting creatures appeared during this time. Plant life, especially seeded plants, continued to diversify and spread across the globe. However, animal life is really where we can find interesting life forms. During the Permian, two major groups of animals evolved, the synapsids and the diapsids. These two groups differ by the amount of fenestras or openings in their skull. Synapsids have one, while diapsids have two. These two different groups, while not very different at the time, would each go on to diversify and create two of the most significant lineages in the history of life. 
The first diapsids would go on to become the ancestors of almost all reptiles, including the dinosaurs. Meanwhile, the synapsids, while they were very reptilian at the time, would go on to become the ancestors of all mammals, including all of you watching this video right now. One of the most well-known synapsids of this time was the Dimetrodon, the 3.5 meter or 11.5 foot long stem mammal, which is often mistaken for a dinosaur. By the end of the Permian, many synapsids would evolve into therapsids, a group of synapsids from which all mammals descend from. Among the therapsids were many bizarre groups of animals, such as the Dinocephalians. Name meaning terrible head, this group of therapsids are known for their bizarre head shapes. One of the most well-known animals from this group, a Steminosuchus, shows pretty much a perfect example of the head shapes these creatures possessed. Another significant group of therapsids from the Permian were the Gorgonopsids. They were the apex predators of the late Permian, and one of the most ferocious predators in the history of life. They were around 3 meters or 10 feet long, and had large jaws fit with fangs. Most notably, there is some evidence to suggest that Gorgonopsids had small hairs, which would have been a first for therapsids. The herbivorous Dicynodonts, such as Lystrosaurus, were another group of therapsids which made their living through living in burrows and feeding on plants and roots. Finally, there were the Cynodonts. Cynodonts were small and resourceful therapsids with the appearance of a rodent. They lived in burrows and were mostly carnivorous. By the early Permian, all of the major land masses on Earth were joined together into the well-known supercontinent of Pangaea. In terms of the ocean, the long-lived Pantalassic Ocean dominated the rest of the Earth. For much of the early Permian, parts of Pangaea were covered in glacial ice sheets. However, during this period, these glaciers would disappear as the temperatures around the equator skyrocketed to 74 degrees Celsius, or 165 Fahrenheit. The formation of Pangaea made conditions extremely difficult for life on land. As if the climate wasn't already scorching enough, the landmass prevented rainwater from reaching the center of the continent. Despite these violent conditions, however, life would find a way, but it would only just barely bounce back from what would happen next. The Permian-Triassic mass extinction began approximately 252 million years ago, at the end of the Permian period, and proceeded into the Triassic period. It took place over about a million years, which, compared to most other mass extinctions, is incredibly brief. Like many extinctions, we aren't 100% sure what caused the Permian extinction. Some theories suggest the possibility of an asteroid collision, or a rise in methane-producing bacteria, which would have made the atmosphere and oceans toxic were to blame. Despite the uncertainties, however, there is one theory which has a lot of evidence to back it up, which is considered to be the most likely cause of the Great Dying. In Russia is a shockingly large 7 million square kilometer, or 3 million square mile, expanse of land covered in igneous rock, known as the Siberian Traps. Igneous rock results from cooled lava, which means, somehow, this 7 million square kilometer expanse of land was at one time blanketed in lava. Such a thing may have been possible during the Permian period, thanks to the newly formed supercontinent of Pangaea. Because of the tectonic collisions taking place, a large pocket of magma may have formed under the supercontinent, causing large-scale volcanism in what is now western Siberia. This would have resulted in a lava plume that could have lasted for over a million years, masking over 7 million square kilometers in molten lava. However, it wasn't the lava which disrupted the entire globe. These continuous violent eruptions would have released tons of toxic gases, such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and hydrogen sulfide, which may have made the atmosphere toxic. Terrestrial plants would have been hit hard by these toxic atmospheres, and thus many terrestrial animals, which relied on these plants, would die out. As well as affecting the atmosphere, these gases would have caused a greenhouse climate, not unlike the one we are already heading towards today. This would have led to an intense global warming, which would have worsened the already arid conditions on land. The extinction of many plants would also have made these climate conditions worse, since there was not as many plants to draw in carbon dioxide and stabilize the atmosphere. 
this global warming would have had a major impact on the seas as well. The rising temperatures would have been too warm for many marine organisms, and would have also starved the seas of oxygen, causing a global marine anoxic event. The oceans would become even more unbreathable, as much as the carbon dioxide went unabsorbed. High levels of CO2 in the ocean would have caused the pH levels or toxicity levels to rise. Tectonic collisions at Pangaea may have also caused the destruction of many marine habitats and disrupted oceanic currents. As conditions continued to get worse and worse, the planet would slowly become more and more uninhabitable. While not hit nearly as hard as life in the oceans, life on land was still hit really hard by the extinction. Many of the bizarre and unique species of synapsids were wiped out, including the gorgonopsids and the dinocephalians. Insects were hit exceptionally hard as well. In fact, the Permian-Triassic extinction took the heaviest toll on insect biodiversity out of all the five mass extinctions. This extinction killed off 83% of insect genera in just a million years. But the true carnage was in the oceans. Since ocean life relies heavily on a stable oxygen condition, the aquatic anoxia took a heavy toll. The extinction killed over 95% of all ammonites, brachiopods, and gastropods. The unique apex predators such as Helicoprion would also meet their extinction. Rising pH levels in the ocean would also cause the bleaching and extinction of many species of coral and the fish that relied on them. Most devastatingly though, 100% of all goniotites, blastoids, and canthodes and eurypterid sea scorpions would die out. And after 290 million years, the reign of the trilobite ended as 100% of all trilobites went extinct. Overall, 70 to 80% of all terrestrial life and a staggering 96% of all marine life were wiped off the face of the earth for good, giving a total average of around 90%. When the dust settled, much of the planet appeared to be barren and lifeless, not unlike how it appeared billions of years ago during the Precambrian. The Permian extinction was so devastating that scientists consider it to be the end of the Paleozoic era and the beginning of the Mesozoic. It would take life almost 30 million years to recover. This was the closest life on Earth ever came to dying, and probably the closest it ever will until the day it does go extinct. The Permian-Triassic mass extinction resulted in one of the most bizarre periods in Earth's history, the Triassic. A few synapsids would survive to see this period, including the Dicynodont Lystrosaurus. In fact, not only would Lystrosaurus live to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it would flourish in the barren landscape of the early Triassic. With all their predators and competition wiped off the face of the Earth, and plenty of roots in the ground for food, there was nothing stopping these beaver-sized goofballs from dominating the planet. Lystrosaurus numbers skyrocketed during the first few million years of the Triassic, to the point that they made up almost 75 to 95 percent of all land-living animals. However, an old rival would see them to their extinction. The diapsids were back, and with some of the only synapsids left being defenseless four-legged meatballs, they were ready to exact revenge for all the years of living in the Synapsid's shadows. Monsters such as Erythrosuchus were some of the first archosaurs, a group of diapsids which would later include the non-avian dinosaurs. These archosaurs would thrive on the plentiful and defenseless Lystrosaurus. Eventually, the Lystrosaurus, the short-lived rulers of the world, would no longer waddle through the Triassic landscape. However, synapsids wouldn't go completely extinct. Resourceful cynodonts would survive the extinction and the predatory archosaurs, and would go on to evolve into the first mammals many a millions of years later. It is thanks to these adaptable underdogs that you sit here watching this video today. The effects of the Permian-Triassic mass extinction will be felt well into the Triassic, but not as decreases in biodiversity, but rather as increases. With a good 90% of all life on Earth extinct, the ones who remained were left many environmental niches to fill. During the Triassic period, evolution would run wild, creating some of the most bizarre prehistoric animals in the fossil record 
such as Adipodentatus or Tanitrophius, and it is believed that this swell in evolution led to the most iconic prehistoric beasts of them all, the dinosaurs. So, now you know how the Permian-Triassic mass extinction coined the name the Great Dying, due to its unrivaled effects on biodiversity. Now you know the story of how life almost died. The story of life on Earth is, without a doubt, one of the best stories ever told. For the past few billion years, life has endured, and for the past 500 million years, complex life forms have ruled the world. And throughout complex life story, there have been five big bottlenecks that have hindered its progress. These are the five mass extinction events. Today we will be exploring the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, which ended the Triassic on the Triassic-Jurassic border. While it is a relatively unknown extinction, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction is incredibly significant since it paved the way for the age of the dinosaurs. However, the Triassic period itself is a very interesting time during Earth's history. And I've know I said that for every period we've explored in the series, but trust me when I say that the Triassic is definitely the most bizarre period that we will explore in this entire series. So anyways, before we explore the Triassic mass extinction, we must first explore the world it took place in. The Triassic period is the seventh period of the Phanerozoic Eon and the first period of the Mesozoic Era. It began around 252 million years ago and ended around 201 million years ago. It was preceded by the Permian period and followed by the Jurassic period. Sadly, despite its uniqueness, the Triassic is often overshadowed by the other periods of the Mesozoic Era, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods. Many things about the Triassic are very interesting. But perhaps the most interesting component is the life that lived at the time. However, in order to understand life in the Triassic, we must first have a good understanding of the climate and geography. The preceding Permian-Triassic mass extinction had really taken its toll on the climate of the world, and these effects would be felt well into the Triassic. For the majority of the Triassic, the climate on land was very hot and dry, reaching temperatures ranging from 50 to 60 degrees Celsius or 122 to 140 Fahrenheit. The seas were slightly cooler, reaching around 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. The land was mostly dominated by harsh deserts. This was in part because at the time, all of the land masses on Earth were joined together into one big supercontinent called Pangaea. This prevented rainwater from reaching the center of the supercontinent. Almost entirely encircled by eastern Pangaea were the Paleotethys and Tethys oceans. Meanwhile, the remainder of the globe was covered in an all-too-familiar body of water, the Pantalassic Ocean. When the Triassic began, the world was just barely beginning to recover from the most deadly extinction event in the history of life, which, as I briefly explained in the previous video, played a big role in the bizarre evolutionary achievements that took place during the Triassic. With a good 90% of all life extinct, many ecological niches were left open, and the few who remained would evolve to fill these niches. As a result, evolution would run wild during the Triassic, creating some of the most bizarre life forms in the fossil record. The few marine species that squeezed through the Permian-Triassic border, such as the conodonts, ammonites, sea urchins, and rayfin fish, would go on to diversify across the early Triassic. During this time, the first true corals as we know them today would also evolve. Many familiar species such as gastropods, bivalves, and brachiopods roamed the seafloor. One of the most significant marine animals to evolve at this time was a group of marine reptiles known as the ichthyosaurs. The largest of these reptiles was the Shastasaurus, which are thought to have possibly reached lengths of 21 meters or 69 feet. The Triassic marked the beginning of an age of marine reptiles that would endure for the next 170 million years until the end of the Mesozoic. One of the most bizarre animals to live during the Triassic was one of these marine reptiles. Adipodentatus reached lengths of around 2.7 meters, or 9 feet, and appeared during the early Triassic. It is most well known for its more than unique jaw, which appeared to be shaped almost in a hammerhead-like manner. It would use this goofy mouth for eating aquatic plants. Another weird semi-aquatic reptile from the early Triassic is the Tanistrophius, 
which is probably one of my favorite prehistoric animals of all time. This animal reached around a length of 6 meters or 20 feet. However, its ridiculously long neck made up over half of its body length at around 3 meters or 10 feet long. Other than that, though, there aren't really any major things we need to touch on in the seas of the Triassic. So now we move on to life on land, where things start to get even more interesting. Life on land is really where the evidence of this surge in evolution can be found. A new group of animals called the archosaurs had evolved by the early Triassic and would go on to dominate the terrestrial world. At the time, one of the most successful clades of archosaurs was the Erythrosuchidae, the most famous of which was the apex predator Erythrosuchus, whose meter-long jaw accounted for almost 20% of its body length. Probably the most dominant archosaurs at the time, though, were the Pseudosuchians, a group of large crocodile-like carnivores such as Postosuchus and Sarcosuchus. For the majority of the Triassic, the Pseudosuchians were the apex predators. Towards the middle of the Triassic, another group of archosaur morphs would appear, and that they were somewhat insignificant at the time, they would go on to rule the world once their competition was wiped out. These, of course, were the first dinosaurs, such as Eoraptor and Coelophysis, whose resourcefulness and adaptability allowed them to survive the trials of the Pangean Plains. Alongside them appeared the Pterosaurs, another group of archosaurs that would go on to rule the skies. One of the most important non-archosaur morphs to live during this time were the Cynodonts. They were a group of synapsids that had survived the Permian extinction and were the underdogs of their time. These are the ancestors of the first mammals, and it is thanks to them that the world is the way we know it today. Life was going incredibly well in the wake of such devastation, but it was never prepared for what happened next. Now, I want to make it known that I am really glossing over things when it comes to covering the Triassic wildlife. There is so much more to what I briefly covered, and we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. But since the focus on this video is supposed to be on the Triassic mass extinction and not the period itself, I thought it would be kind of weird if the video chapter on Triassic life was longer than the one on the extinction. The Triassic is a very interesting period, though, and definitely deserves its own video someday. But anyways, let's move on to the next section. The Triassic ended very much the same way it began with the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. And just like most mass extinctions, we don't know for sure what caused it. It occurred during the final few million years of the Triassic, though there is some evidence to suggest that the extinction would have begun over 18 million years before the end of the period. There are many theories about the cause of this devastation, but a more likely possibility is that many causes came together to form the extinction. The end Triassic extinction had a very interesting effect on Triassic life, but before we explore these effects and the feature they caused, we must first explore the possible causes for the extinction. Similar to many other extinction events, some scientists consider the possibility that an asteroid may have struck Earth similar to the one at the end of the Mesozoic. There is some evidence to support this, as an impact crater that has been discovered in Quebec, Canada. This crater is one of the biggest impact craters from the Mesozoic, only second to the one that killed the dinosaurs. However, the asteroid that caused it wouldn't have been even close to big enough to cause an extinction on the scale of the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. Many smaller collisions have also been found and connected to the end of the Triassic, so a likely possibility is that these many asteroid collisions did still contribute to the extinction by fueling other causes. Overall, the asteroid collision on its own is a very unlikely cause for this extinction event. Another theory states that gradual climate change may have been responsible for the end Triassic mass extinction. The hot climate would have continued to increase, causing arid and dry conditions. An increase in evaporite and carbonate deposits from this time period supports this theory, as they are deposits which are most abundant in dry climates. Changing sea levels and increased ocean acidification may have also played a role in affecting marine life. Also, geological processes may have affected the diversity of land biomes, causing a challenge for the unique wildlife that had evolved to fit these unique environments. The impact that these changes may have had on Triassic life is not very clear to us, and it is very possible that they were not nearly as deadly as we first expected. Now, as we have already established with the other causes, it is more likely that this cause, combined with other factors, resulted in the extinction. Regardless of how many causes there were, however, 
there is one possibility that is considered to be the main and most probable cause of the extinction. The leading theory for the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction event is an increase in large volcanic eruptions caused by the tectonic processes of Pangaea, similar to the causes of the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. Many of these eruptions would have taken place in the central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or CAMP. We know this because within this province lies an 11 million square kilometer, or 4.2 million square mile, blanket of igneous rock, which covers much of southeastern North America, northeastern South America, northwestern Africa, and southwestern Europe. It is one of the biggest igneous rock provinces known to us today. In fact, it may have been even bigger than we thought, since erosion has seemed to have weathered away much of the province. Anyways, these volcanic eruptions were caused by the beginning of the expansion of the Atlantic Ocean. These massive volcanic eruptions could have lasted anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 years, and would have been detrimental to the Triassic environment. These eruptions would have caused rapid global warming. Temperatures across the Triassic world increased by 3 to 4 degrees Celsius worldwide. There is even some evidence to suggest that some regions might have experienced temperature increases of over 10 degrees Celsius. The increased temperatures would have pushed the already struggling terrestrial ecosystem to its limits. The sea life would also experience challenges, as the CO2 and other volcanic gases raised pH levels in the waters, causing the oceans to become acidic. Along with the extinction of many ocean vertebrates, this would have led to the bleaching of coral reefs, and thus the extinction of many corals and the creatures that relied on them. This uptick in CO2 levels would have also caused the oceans to become stagnant as most of the gas went unabsorbed, causing marine anoxia. Meanwhile, life on land was still really struggling. While the volcanic gases may have caused long-term global warming, gases such as sulfur dioxide may have been responsible for a short-term global cooling. These conditions would have favored the endothermic animals of the time, thus leading to the extinction of many exothermic species. These eruptions may have also released a lot of toxic mercury, which would have subjected animals to mercury poisoning. Finally, the intense global warming may have caused an increase in lightning storms, which combined with the hot and dry climates would have caused extensive wildfires across the globe. All of these consequences of the camp eruptions combined with the possibility of asteroid strikes and gradual climate change beforehand ultimately came together in the end to cause the Triassic mass extinction event. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction, despite being relatively unknown, holds a lot of significance as a chapter in the story of life. This is because of the impact it had on the life of the Triassic and the world that would result from it. The extinction killed off almost all archosauromorphs, other than the dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilomorphs. Also, it saw a large decrease in the population of ammonites. However, ammonite numbers had already been declining before the extinction, so it didn't take long for them to readapt and get back on track. The extinction also saw the complete eradication of the conodonts, the eel-like creatures known for their bizarre feeding apparatus that had been with us since the Cambrian and Ordovician periods. Overall, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction event took a heavy toll on the Triassic world, with around 20-23% to 23 of all taxonomic families and 48% of all genera disappearing and around 70 to 76 percent of all life on Earth being wiped out. Despite the tragic nature of this event, it is the least deadly of the Big Five mass extinctions. The ending of the Triassic and the beginning of the Jurassic marked a very significant moment in the history of the Earth, as it was the beginning of a time of peace and stability. A true peaceful Earth, unaffected by climate change, volcanoes, and other terrible events for almost 135 million years. This peacetime began with the rise of a new breed of animals, one which had only evolved a few million years earlier during the turmoils of the Triassic, and was possessive of a very important trait, adaptability. I'm of course talking about the dinosaurs, who after surviving this extinction would go on to be the rulers of this age of peace, or rather this age of dinosaurs. There are many theories as to how dinosaurs survived the Entriassic extinction, but one theory is that they may have evolved to be endothermic or to have feathers. This would have allowed them to retreat up or down into poles during the intense global warming and would have also helped them endure the brief global cooling. 
The same theories are held for the survival of pterosaurs and crocodilians, who would go on to rule alongside the dinosaurs during the Age of Peace. So that's probably how dinosaurs survived the bottleneck of the end of the Triassic. But how exactly did they take over the world? Well, if you've been following the series or know your fair share about mass extinctions, then you know the effects that they can have on the biodiversity of the world afterward. With the majority of their neighbors wiped out, the survivors are left to fill the empty ecological niches left behind. The same happened with the dinosaurs. Since they were so diverse and adaptable, they quickly took up many of the niches left behind by the other extinct archosaurs before anybody else could get there. This left many non-dinosaur creatures, such as mammals, to walk in their shadows for the rest of the Mesozoic, since they left barely any dominant niches for the other clades to fill. Marine reptiles such as plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs survived the extinction and would go on to rule the seas during the remainder of the Mesozoic. Meanwhile, the pterosaurs would continue to take to the skies and during their reign would develop into some of the largest flying animals that ever exist, such as Quetzalcoatlus and Hatzegopteryx. Life was good and peaceful for the inhabitants of the Jurassic and Cretaceous globe for almost 135 million years as the dinosaurs roamed the Earth. But then something happened. Just by chance, after over 100 million years of peace, the entire future of the Earth was changed in a mere instant. But more on that next time. So there you have it. That is the story of the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction event, the extinction which was eerily similar to the one that occurred only 50 million years before it, which paved the way for the rise of the dinosaurs. Ever since the Cambrian explosion 541 million years ago, complex life has faced challenge after challenge. Extinctions, climate change, tectonic collisions, sometimes all at the same time, have threatened to end the journey of life. While our Earth may be one of the only worlds that is suitable for life, it is still incredibly hostile. And for hundreds of millions of years, life was forced to squeeze through these bottlenecks. Until around 201 million years ago, at the end of the Triassic, when the rise of a new lineage of animals would mark the beginning of over 130 million years of peace and prosperity, a world untouched by climate change, tectonic processes, and extinctions, which was allowed to prosper under the rule of some of the most powerful and well-known prehistoric beasts ever known, the dinosaurs. But if there's one thing that we all know about good things, it's that they are never meant to last. 66 million years ago, at the end of the Mesozoic, a cataclysmic event would change the world forever, ending this age of peace and the age of the non-avian dinosaurs. Today we will be exploring the most recent of the Big Five mass extinctions, the Cretaceous-Paleogene mass extinction, or the KPG mass extinction. This is probably the most well-known extinction event out of the five, because it saw the end of the non-avian dinosaurs. We all know the classic tale of the meteorite that struck Earth and snuffed out the rule of monsters like Tyrannosaurus. But today I plan to go in depth and explain how just one space rock managed to change the world forever. But before we do that, we must first explore the world it struck. The Cretaceous is the ninth period of the Phanerozoic Eon and the third and final of the Mesozoic Era, it began around 145.5 million years ago and ended 66 million years ago. It lasted for a grand total of 80 million years. And to put into perspective how long that is, the Cenozoic era in which we currently live, which encapsulates all of the time after the Cretaceous period, has only lasted for 66 million years so far, meaning this period is longer than an era. Which honestly isn't really a fair comparison, since the Cenozoic hasn't finished yet, but you get my point. The Cretaceous was preceded by the Jurassic period and followed by the Paleogene period and Cenozoic era. The geography of the late Cretaceous was just beginning to become reminiscent of how the world looks today before the end of the period. North America had just begun to form as Africa started to drift away from South America up towards Eurasia, where China and Europe were beginning to form. Meanwhile, Australia was still breaking away from Antarctica. And between this newly born Australia and what is today China was the Tethys Ocean. In between Africa and South America was the newly formed South Atlantic, 
which stretched up into the newborn north atlantic between north america and eurasia something to note about the continent at this time is that many of the coasts that we know today were still submerged under water which is partially why the continents appeared somewhat smaller and differently shaped at the time this was due to the fact that the sea levels were almost 168 meters or 550 feet higher than they are today this may have been partially because the cretaceous was generally warmer than it is today reaching up to 30 degrees celsius or 86 fahrenheit at the equator year round this would have melted the ice caps and caused the high sea levels the climate was also very humid due to these higher temperatures the cretaceous seas were not a place you would want to go swimming in at all in fact many people have taken to calling them the most deadly seas in the history of earth and that title is definitely deserved these prehistoric oceans were home to the long-necked carnivorous plesiosaurs which could be anywhere from 1.5 meters 5 feet to 15 meters or 49 feet other marine predators such as sharks also swam these seas out of all the fish in these seas however the most deadly was probably the zipfactinus which could reach lengths of 6 meters or 20 feet they had needle-sharp teeth and were infamous for devouring whatever they could get in their mouths but definitely the most deadly animals in this ocean were the mosasaurs they were a group of carnivorous marine reptiles the largest of which known as mosasaurus hoffmani or hoffman's mosasaur could reach lengths of up to 17 meters or 56 feet these enormous sea monsters are almost definitely the apex predators of the most deadly seas in the history of life. Under the rule of these great reptiles were some familiar faces, such as the ammonites and mollusks. So that's a very basic rundown of the Cretaceous Seas, which means we can now move on to land, which is probably what most of you are waiting for me to talk about. Land life from the Cretaceous needs no introduction. We've all been taught about monstrous dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex and giant soaring pterosaurs like Quetzalcoatlus. But for the purpose of this video, I will give you all a quick rundown of what the land looked like at the time. The Cretaceous was the peak of the dinosaurs' rule, the time when they were at their most diverse and powerful. Dinosaurs took up almost all dominant ecological niches, from ruthless carnivores to gentle giants. Massive sauropods like Brachiosaurus towered over other animals and ate leaves from the treetops and would become some of the largest land animals to ever live. Meanwhile, other smaller but still massive herbivores like Triceratops and Ankylosaurus roamed the forest floors, feeding off ferns and using their horns and club tails to ward off predators. Among these predators were animals such as Velociraptor, the ravenous feathery chicken-sized theropod who hunted in packs and used its enlarged toe claw to grip onto and kill larger prey. Many medium-sized animals such as Ornithomimus and Gallomimus sped around avoiding predators and looking for food. And of course, we cannot talk about Cretaceous dinosaurs and not mention the most famous dinosaur of all time, the Tyrannosaurus rex. This disturbingly smart, monstrous theropod reached heights of up to 3.7 meters or 12 feet and lengths of around 9 meters 30 feet to 12 meters or 40 feet and was the apex predator during the last few million years of the Cretaceous. Dinosaurs were not the only land animals during the Cretaceous, however. The pterosaurs, a group of archosaurs which survived the Triassic mass extinction, were the undisputed rulers of the skies. Monsters like Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsagopteryx could reach the sizes of giraffes at around 5.5 meters or 18 feet tall. On the forest floor of the Cretaceous were the mammals. During the late Cretaceous, they were just tiny egg thieves, scrounging to find enough food as the dinosaurs' rule prevented them from taking up any dominant niches. However, that would not remain the same for long. Now, similar to my video on the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, I'm really only touching the tip of the iceberg here. There is so much more to the Cretaceous than what I mentioned. But once again, I thought it would be weird if the video segment on the ecosystem itself was longer and more in-depth than the one on the extinction. Especially since this extinction is probably the most simple and easy to explain, I really had to shorten the first section of the video. But anyways, now let's move on to the KPG mass extinction. The Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, also known as the KPG or KT mass extinction, took place approximately 66 million years ago on the Cretaceous Paleogene border. This catastrophic event changed the world and its inhabitants forever. In fact, the change was so massive that the KPG mass extinction ended the Mesozoic era and began the Cenozoic. Unlike basically every other mass extinction we've explored on this list, however, scientists have been able to pinpoint an exact and singular cause for this extinction. And because of the popularity of this extinction, the likelihood is you probably already know what that cause is. 
in the Gulf of Mexico lies a crater approximately 180 kilometers or 110 miles in diameter and 20 kilometers or 12 miles in depth. This massive impact crater was caused by a 9.6 kilometer or 6 mile wide meteorite. At first, scientists didn't know what to make of it. It wasn't until a layer of 66 million year old iridium rich clay found in many locations across the globe was connected to this asteroid impact that things truly started to fall into their places. The crater and these iridium layers pointed to a devastating impact that took place at the end of the Mesozoic, which is now accepted to be the cause of the KPG mass extinction. Let's set the stage. Imagine the Gulf of Mexico, 66 million years ago. Dinosaurs roam the nearby shores, while marine reptiles swim just under the surface of the water, and pterosaurs fly just over it. These creatures go about their day, oblivious to their impending doom. Suddenly, without warning, a 9.6 kilometer wide asteroid slams into the sea at 20 kilometers or 12 miles a second. The impact is so sudden and powerful that the space rock itself, along with anything within proximity of it, vaporizes. In this instance, the energy of equivalent of 10 billion World War II era warheads is released upon the Earth's crust. And the crust doesn't just buckle, it liquefies, thundering away from the impact point like waves. In minutes, the effects are felt all around the world in the forms of magnitude 11 earthquakes. No continent or creature is spared from these violent consequences. Meanwhile, back at the impact point, the throwing up of the Earth's crust has sent out massive tsunamis up to a kilometer or 0.6 miles high out in every direction. These walls of water drown the coast and kill off their unique life. But that's not where it ended. When the asteroid vaporized, it sent out a massive shock wave and heat wave that sent many pieces of debris from the Earth and the meteor out into orbit. Over the next while, some of this debris would fling out into space or strike the moon, but the majority fell back down to Earth. The moment these iridium-filled asteroid fragments first struck the planet, the Cretaceous period ended. These blazing fireballs falling through the sky every second heated the Earth's atmosphere up to oven temperatures for a brief amount of time. Those who couldn't find a way to escape the heat would have met a painful death in the now fiery wasteland that was Earth. But the meteorite still wasn't done yet. Upon impact, it also sent up many gases and smaller debris out into the atmosphere. This debris formed great clouds that shadowed the entire Earth and blocked out the sun for as long as 15 years. This prevented plants from undergoing photosynthesis, which led to a major depletion in plant numbers and the animals that relied on them for energy. This pause in photosynthesis would have starved the atmosphere of oxygen. The lack of sunlight also killed off the majority of the phytoplankton in the seas, causing the death of many marine vertebrates. The sun blockage also caused temperatures to plummet, plunging the whole Earth into an impact winter. Temperatures plummeted by over 15 degrees Celsius or 27 Fahrenheit. When the dust finally settled, the sun would shine on a very different world. The Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, though it was very brief compared to some other extinction events, did incredible damage to Earth and its inhabitants. The main killers were the temporary blazing temperatures and the blocking out of the sun. Animals which couldn't escape the hot temperatures in some way were cooked alive. Then the lack of sunlight killed off most of the bases of marine and terrestrial food webs, the phytoplankton, and the terrestrial plants. The death of these important organisms started a chain reaction as the herbivores began to die from starvation, which eventually led to the extinction of carnivorous animals. The collapse of ecosystems underwater led to the extinction of almost all marine reptiles, including the monstrous mosasaurs, ending their reign. Along with the marine reptiles, the ammonites, the well-known spiral-shelled cephalopods, which had first appeared during the Ordovician period, went 100% extinct. The KPG mass extinction event killed 60% of all marine species. Meanwhile, the effects devastated the land and its once great rulers. The dominant dinosaurs were being snuffed out as the ecosystems they were on top of crumbled beneath their feet. After many years of struggle, all non-avian dinosaurs would meet their extinction ending the reign of the dinosaurs. Overall, the KPG mass extinction killed off 17% of all families, 50% of all genera, and 75-76% to 76 of all life on Earth. Now that we have explored the final mass extinction, we have completed our ranking list in terms of severity, with the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction in last place, the Late Devonian mass extinction in fourth, 
the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction itself in third, the Ordovician Silurian extinction in second, and the Permian Triassic mass extinction in first place. The Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction event may not have been the most deadly, but due to the popularity of the dinosaurs, it will likely always remain the most well known mass extinction. As the dust clouds cleared and the first rays of sun to nourish the earth and over a decade broke through, they shone on a very different world, a devastated world, still recovering from the extinction, a world of small critters and sparse plants, but perhaps most significantly, a world without dinosaurs. The Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, like all the other extinctions before it, changed the world forever. The extinction ended the Mesozoic era and began the Cenozoic, which is sometimes referred to as the Age of Mammals. Contradictory to popular belief, while it is true that, with the dinosaurs mostly out of the picture, the mammals would eventually rise to dominance on the Earth, such a thing did not happen for many millions of years after the Cretaceous. For much of the Paleogene, many mammals were still small, relatively insignificant animals, which were ruled over by birds such as Gastronus. That's not to say that all mammals were like this, though. The first hints of mammal dominance began around this time, as they started to fill some of the ecological niches left behind by the dinosaurs. Over the next few tens of millions of years, the mammals and other animals left behind by the extinction would evolve into the modern-day animals we know today. And that, everybody, was the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, the most recent mass extinction which is famous for wiping out the dinosaurs and paving the way for mammal dominance. And sadly, the last mass extinction we will explore in this series. It has truly been a journey, and I have loved sharing it with you. And if there's one thing that we should take away from this video series, it's that life is fragile, and major changes, ones like what us humans are doing to our planet, can damage ecosystems, cause extinctions, and change the world forever. Over 99% of all species that ever lived are now extinct, but the less than 1% that we still have around us today is still pretty cool. So let's make sure that we don't accidentally cause a mass extinction like the ones millions of years before us, so that we can cherish this wonderful planet for as long as possible. Thanks for watching. Please keep in mind that this is an informal source of information. While the sources used are considered reliable, this source should not be used for professional or educational purposes, except that the information presented can be confirmed by other sources or an expert slash educator.